We want to extend to you greetings in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. A big, uh, a big greeting to those of you from our church, Redemption Hill, for our friends and family. We love you guys. We miss you. And you can see my face. I wish I could see all of your faces. Uh, but we send you greetings this morning. I also want to say hello to some of our friends from afar, those who aren't part of our church on a week-to-week -week basis, but uh, maybe people, friends from Kansas City or, or even farther away who are checking in this morning. We're thankful for your love and for your support. We want to say hello to you. And then I also want to uh, just greet those of you who may not know us at all, but perhaps you're curious. Maybe uh, you just stumbled across us online or more likely than not, um, a friend of yours sent a link to you and invited you to watch our live stream this morning. Uh, we are praying for you today, and we hope that you will be pointed to Jesus Christ, and I hope someday we get a chance to meet. Um, it is highly unusual for us, as you all know, I probably don't have to remind you of that, highly unusual for us to be at home on a Sunday morning and streaming a church service online. Uh, it seems right now in our nation and in our world that things are changing rapidly. They're changing seemingly on a minute-by-minute minute basis, and we're doing our best to adapt. Um, that's part of why we're, we're offering this live stream today. And even this uh, live stream is different than it was last week. Um, the setup's a little bit different. We've learned some things since last week. And also Carrie and Tally uh, ended up pre-recording our music from home. That was just a better fit this time around. Uh, I'll be preaching live to you uh, here in a little bit. Um, but I want to just remind you before we begin worshiping something that doesn't change, something that is constant. And that is the fact that God is on his throne today, right now. He rules and he reigns in glory and in power. And secondly, we desperately need to behold him and to receive the truth of his word, to be fed by the truth of scriptures. And so even though the world around us is changing, our God is the same yesterday and today and forever. And I hope that your heart is eager like mine to worship him today and to receive from his truth. So with that, we're gonna move into our time of musical worship this morning. I hope you will participate to the fullest. All right, well, good morning. Well, it actually isn't morning here. It's five o'clock in the evening at the time we're recording this, but it will be morning when you guys see it. and. Um, We'll be in our living room watching it with you and singing along uh, with these worship songs. So I'm glad that even though we cannot be together um, as a church body in person, we can be together. We can unite our hearts together in worship to our great God this morning. And uh, so I'm going to read from Psalm 95 to encourage us to focus our hearts upon our great king in worship the psalmist writes, O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it and his hands formed the dry land. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand.
Psalm 107. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from trouble. For he satisfies the longing soul, and the hungry soul he fills with good things. Some sat in darkness and in the shadow of death, prisoners in affliction and in irons. 
for they had rebelled against the words of God and spurned the counsel of the Most High. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death and burst their bonds apart. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man. And let them offer sacrifices of thanksgiving and tell of his deeds in songs of joy.
All right, well, let's go ahead and pray, and then we'll begin our time in the Word together this morning. Please bow your heads with me. Lord Jesus, we are thankful today for your mercy. We're thankful for the fountain that can cleanse even the vilest of stains in us. And we want to pause this morning, Jesus, and just worship you and thank you for the incredible grace and love you have shown to us. And Lord, I pray that you would now enable us to respond to your grace in faith, with a submissive heart, with an eagerness to learn and to hear and to obey all that you would say to us. Lord Jesus, you are our Savior, and we bow before you also as our Master and our Lord. So speak to us now. I pray, Lord, that you would energize me with your Holy Spirit, and that you would take the words that are spoken, the word that is preached, and use it to affect people's hearts, to bring about change, and, and to bring about um, a, a deeper commitment to you. We pray, Lord, for all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to invite you to turn in your Bibles this morning to James chapter 2. James chapter 2 in our text this morning is going to be verses 1 through 13. James chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. Pastor Kent Hughes writes this about the book of James. He says, James is preeminently a moral theologian. For him, what we do says far more about the authenticity of our faith than what we say we believe. In James's moral theology, God's message to us is that genuine faith is to affect everything that we do. It controls everything. In chapter one, we saw that genuine faith controls how we respond to trials, that we count it all joy and we seek wisdom from God. Chapter one shows us how we should respond to temptation, uh, that, that we should believe every good gift comes from God and we should avoid this, the temptation or the deception rather that temptation offers. And, and it showed us how we should respond to the word, that we should be quick to hear and that we should be doers. And now in chapter two, we discover that faith in Christ should also control how we respond to other people. The people in James's day had a problem and so do we. We are prone to use the world's measuring stick in assigning value to other people. And that's a problem. We are too often shaped by our culture rather than being shaped by the word. And we tend to look at people from an earthly perspective rather than seeing them the way that God sees them. The issue that James addresses in this text is that his readers tended to see or, or tended to gravitate towards the rich, those who were wealthy, those who were successful, those who were popular, while they were ignoring the poor, the struggling, and the unknown. And James's point to them, and God's point to us this morning, is this. Faith in Christ should move us to love other people without distinction. There should be no partiality, no preferential treatment. We are to love others without distinction. Our world is full of partiality. It's marked by bias. Many people display a sort of favoritism. But the church, the body of Christ, we are called to be different. The church is to be a counterculture. It's, we are to weigh value differently, to show love without partiality. And James gives us three powerful arguments that strongly confront the sin of partiality within the church. And the first we find in verses one through four, and it's this, showing partiality is incompatible with faith in Christ. Look in verses one through four. My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my feet, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? The problem with putting too much stock in wealth, is that it really shows a lack of perspective. James has already pointed out the folly of putting too much stock in wealth, of boasting in wealth. Back in chapter 1, verse 11, he wrote that the sun rises with its scorching heat 
and withers the grass. Its flower falls, its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. But the people that James wrote to were lacking this perspective. So wrapped up within this opening command, the command to show no partiality, wrapped up within it is a powerful perspective changer. He points us not simply to the emptiness of riches, but to the supremacy of Jesus Christ, the one in whom we have placed our faith. He is the Lord Jesus Christ. Look in verse one. Show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. To call Jesus Lord is to call him master, to acknowledge that he is over us and has all authority. If you remember back in chapter one, verse one, James had introduced himself as a servant of the Lord. Jesus is master, James is servant. And here he reminds us that we are too. We are also servants of the Lord. And therefore we are to serve him and not to serve our own interests. Showing partiality, giving deferential treatment to those who have something that could benefit us shows that we are not submitted to the Lord, but serving ourselves. He calls Jesus, uh, he, he calls him by his name Jesus, the Greek form of the Hebrew name Joshua, which means the Lord saves. So Jesus is our Lord, he's our master, but he's also our savior. He is Jesus, Yeshua, the one who has rescued us and redeemed us by his grace. This reminds us that true spiritual riches are ours in Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 8, 9 says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. You see, we are supposed to value what Christ has done for us, not to place value in what some mere man might potentially do for us. He calls him the Lord. He calls him Jesus. He also calls him the Christ. Jesus is the king. He's the one who was promised as the son of David, the one who is destined to rule over the nations, the one who has ascended to the right hand of the father. You see, Jesus is not just our master. Jesus is Lord of all. He is the king. So how can we be impressed by the importance of some mere person who comes into our midst when the God-man, Jesus Christ, has called us into his kingdom. You see, James is giving us a different perspective here. We have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And not only does James remind us of the supremacy of Christ, but also of the splendor of Christ. He calls him the Lord of glory. And I love here how the, this majestic title, the Lord of glory, instantly contrasts with the trivial, empty value of human wealth in verse two. The end of verse one, he calls him the Lord of glory. And then in verse two, he says, if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, that gold ring, that fine clothing, those symbols of wealth were a kind of glory, something that caught the eye of those who were present and impressed them. But should we really be impressed by that when we know who Jesus Christ is? If you're impressed by that, the only explanation can be that you have forgotten about Jesus and your perspective is off. You see, there's massive implications to holding the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. If you claim to believe in him and you claim to belong to him, you claim to be in a saving relationship to Jesus Christ, then partiality is completely out of place. Why? Why is that? What does my treatment of others have to do with my faith in Jesus Christ? Everything. When you show partial treatment or preferential treatment to someone and you ignore someone else who doesn't have anything to offer you, it reveals who you are really loyal to and it reveals whose agenda you care most about. It shows that you think being friends with the wealthy will bring you certain benefits. It shows that you think being close to those who are successful may be perhaps a useful networking opportunity for your own career. It shows that you think being around those who are popular or beautiful and, or stylish will somehow increase your own social standing. You think that connecting with those who are academically accomplished will somehow add to your own credibility. But you think that being around those 
who you deem beneath you will somehow cost you, that it will drag you down, that it will cause you to miss out on something that is better. My friends, this is nothing more than a supreme concern for self. And this is incompatible with faith in Christ. The advancement of self is incompatible with advancing Christ's glory and being concerned first and foremost with his kingdom. The one who who professes faith in Christ has by definition come to deny self and to proclaim highest loyalty to Christ. We have by definition nailed our agenda to the cross and submitted fully to the agenda of Jesus Christ, our Lord, to his priorities, to his will, to his kingdom. We care most about his purposes. There is no room for partiality in such a heart that has been gripped by faith in Jesus Christ. Verses two through three give us a hypothetical situation that James uses to show us what he's talking about, where this rich man comes in and the poor man comes in and the rich man's invited to the place of prominence while the poor man is given the leftovers. And then he asks a pointed question in verse four that's aimed directly at our consciences. Look in verse four. If that's what you do, if you're doing what's, what, what we find in verses two through three, he says in verse four, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? You see, Christ is Lord, master, and king, and he does not make such distinctions among us. So who do we think that we are to divide people up like that? James says that's sinful behavior. You've made these distinctions among yourselves and that sort of behavior must be stopped. But he presses even deeper than our behavior and he gets to the issue of the heart. He gets to our thoughts. He says, you've become judges with evil thoughts. When we make such distinctions, when we show partiality, it reveals this heart issue that we have a distorted perspective, that we have selfish motives. We have evil thoughts, like a judge who twists the law in order to benefit himself. We've become crooked and unjust. And this is wrong thinking that is underneath and behind that sort of wrong behavior. And James says that needs to be corrected. Those who truly possess faith in the Lord of glory should never be swayed by the empty, vain, temporary glory of clothes or popularity or talent or success or fame or beauty or intellect. No, making distinctions among ourselves based on the measurements of the world does not display faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. It shows our thinking has become infected with the world's values and that we are concerned with self rather than Christ. Showing partiality, James says, is incompatible with genuine faith in Christ. That's why he commands us, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. There's a second argument though that James gives us. Number two, showing partiality is also contrary to the gospel of grace. This is what we find in verses five through seven. He says, listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him. But you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? Showing partiality, James says, is contrary to the gospel of grace. Verse one is the command, don't show partiality. Verses two through three give us a negative example of that. Verse four accuses our, con- our conscience. And now verse five begins James's argument. He's reasoning with us, trying to get us to think correctly. James is ready to convince you, in other words, if you don't agree that showing partiality is wrong. James says that, that if you give preferential treatment to some, then we're actually behaving in the exact opposite of the God who saved us. And we're living out a sort of anti-gospel. It's contrary to the gospel of grace. James points out two specific ways this sort of behavior is contrary to the gospel. First of all, it shows dishonor to those whom God loves. That's verses five and six. God has chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith. Verse six, but you, 
in showing this preferential treatment have dishonored the poor man. The gospel is this. God has chosen in his grace to bestow spiritual riches upon those who are otherwise completely spiritually bankrupt. And this salvation is often extended to those who are, by the world standards, poor. The grace of the gospel is not that we can somehow pay the fee to get in the door to God's kingdom. No, God finds us. He seeks us. He calls us, chooses us, and then lavishes upon us the riches of his grace. And so Paul can say in 2 Corinthians 9, 15, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. You see, the Lord of glory delights to show his glory by saving people who most painfully feel their own need. 1 Corinthians 1, 27 puts it this way, God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. You see, God loves needy people. God saves needy people. And spiritually speaking, that's all of us. It's all of us. For us to discriminate against the poor or those who seem to have little to offer us That's to ignore the fact that God has not treated us that way. We had nothing to offer him. And we were absolutely bankrupt spiritually and morally. In showing partiality, we are failing to extend to others the grace that we have received. Rather than reflecting his love, we are dishonoring the very ones that God has chosen to love and bestow honor upon. Scripture tells us that in the church, In Christ, there is no Jew, no Greek, no slave, no free, no male, no female. We are one in Christ, and we stand on equal footing at the cross. The gospel is the great equalizer. It raises each of us up to new identity in Christ. No one is lowered to achieve this equality. All who trust in Christ are lifted up as a new creation and made heirs with Christ. We are now children of the king, and this is an incredible honor to be chosen by grace, to be an heir of God's grace. God forbid that we would ever dishonor those whom he has honored by pouring out his grace on them. This is contrary to the gospel because it dishonors those whom God has shown love to and grace to and shown honor to. But also it shows disloyalty to the kingdom of God. This is his point in verses six and seven. He says, you've dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? James reminds his readers that these rich people they admired so much that they were fawning over, that they were the ones who were causing so many problems for the body of Christ. All of the the yous in verses six through seven, when he says you, 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 those are all plural in the Greek language, meaning that it's not an individual person that's been mistreated, but collectively as a group, the church had suffered at the hands of the rich. Instead of showing a love for God's people and a loyalty to his name, some of these believers were cuddling up to those who were oppressing God's people and mocking his name. They have blasphemed, James says, the name by which you were called. Two points of clarification are needed here. Is God condemning all who are rich in this text? Is it somehow sinful to be wealthy or to be successful? And is it more righteous and more holy to be poor? No, that's not James's point. I want you to keep in mind here that James is writing to a specific group of people who are living in a specific historical context. Back in chapter one, James is writing to the dispersion. These are Jewish believers who have been scattered away from Jerusalem because of persecution for the sake of the gospel. So they are religiously and ethnically, culturally outsiders in all the places they have gone. And because of that, they've experienced much persecution. And because of that persecution, many of them, most of them even, were poor. This limited their their economic opportunities. It limited their their, um, 
Um, their opportunities to buy and to sell and to work. They were oppressed for the sake of Christ as Jewish believers scattered throughout the Roman Empire. But that doesn't necessarily describe us right now, today, the church in the Midwest, in the United States. Um, so, so I don't want you to think that James's words here about the rich mean that all rich people are under God's condemnation. Um, secondly, not only do we need to take into consideration the historical context, context but we need to remember what other places in Scripture teach us, that God loves rich people, and God saves rich people. He saves the wealthy. Although it is, according to Jesus, hard for a rich man to enter into the kingdom, with God, all things are possible, including the salvation of those who seem to have it all by worldly standards. And aren't we thankful for that as those who live in the United States in 2020, where we have access to video cameras and the internet and cars and things like that. Uh, I'm thankful for that. We have several examples in the New Testament of wealthy believers. We have Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea in John chapter 19. We have Lydia, the wealthy businesswoman whom we meet in Acts chapter 16. And Paul even gives Timothy some instructions on how to pastor wealthy believers in Ephesus. 1 Timothy 6.17, Paul writes to Timothy, as for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. When we read more broadly in scripture, it becomes clear that being wealthy, having resources, is not a sin to be repented of. It is rather a blessing to be used for God's glory. A second point of clarification. Um, so, so first of all, James is not just condemning the rich. It's not a sin to be wealthy or successful. But a second point of clarification is this. Is James condemning one form of discrimination, one kind of partiality, and replacing it with another? Is it somehow righteous for us to, to tilt the scales the opposite direction? Th that we should have a bias against the rich and towards the poor? That we should show preferential treatment towards the oppressed? No, that's not what James is teaching. You see, our righteousness, our treatment of other people, practical righteousness, our moral, ethical behavior is to be a reflection of God's character. And God's standard is perfectly just and equal. This is made abundantly clear in the Old Testament law. There's many places we could point to, but one such text is Leviticus chapter 19, verse 15. In the law of Moses, it says this, you shall do no injustice in court. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great, but in righteousness you shall judge your neighbor. It is unrighteous to have a different measuring stick for different people and to treat people differently, no matter which way we're tilting the scale. It is not biblical to try to stick it to the man, the way some people might say it. There must be equal standards, equal treatment, regardless of where someone's economic standing is. We are to show no partiality, neither to the rich nor to the poor. We are to love without distinction, without distinction. I want to just share a warning, if I may. This is a little bit of a rabbit trail. But it is in vogue right now, politically speaking, to demonize the rich. And in an election year, and there's a lot of rhetoric going on, I want you to be aware that there is often a, a self-righteous claim that's out there in our culture, a self-righteous claim that, that says they want to help the poor, but if you look beneath the surface, beneath the surface, you will often find that what looks like love for the poor is actually enmity towards the rich. If you pull back the curtain, what you'll often find is greed and covetousness, wanting what someone else has. You will find envy, hating someone else because they have what you don't, what you wish you had. You will find when you pull back the curtain, a lust for power, a refusal to be content with where God 
has placed us and a hunger to see the tables turned and to get a sort of revenge over those who seem to have all of the privilege. Too many Christians, too many in the church are quick to jump on that bandwagon because, hey, helping the poor is something that Jesus would do, right? I just want to plead with you not to be naive. Those who push for the overthrow of the rich, they cannot point to James as support because that's not what James is teaching. That's not what he's saying. Very simply, what James is saying, what he is teaching, is he is warning us to beware of honoring those who dishonor Christ and of, and of fawning over those who are actually persecuting the church. James is not arguing for simply a redirection of our sin. He's not saying that we should just rearrange our partiality. No, he's arguing for a complete change in perspective, one that is loyal first and foremost to the kingdom of God, not to our own agenda, also not to a political movement or not to some worldly ideal. He's simply saying we are to love without distinction and not show any partiality because it's contrary to the gospel of grace. Showing partiality is contrary to the gospel because it dishonors those whom God loves and it shows a disloyalty to his kingdom. But there's a third argument he gives us. Showing partiality, third, is morally sinful before God. This is verses 8 through 13. He says, If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery but do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy, to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. James's concern here about not showing partiality is that this kind of behavior is more than just a lack of common courtesy. James isn't just trying to make us nicer people. Showing partiality is a violation of God's holy law. And it is therefore sin and it is therefore serious because it leads to judgment. It leads to judgment. It's serious, first of all, because it's a violation of God's will. That's his point in verses 8 through 11. Jesus has told us that the greatest commandment is to love God completely. And the second commandment related to it is to love your neighbor as yourself. And this is basically a summary of the Ten Commandments. To love God with all your heart is a summary of the vertical commands. And to love your neighbor is a summary of the horizontal responsibilities we have. So partiality disregards the second greatest commandment. And James says it therefore is a violation of the law. And now what James says here in verse 8, in verse 9, that if you show partiality, you're committing sin and are convicted by the law. And in verse 10, that if you fail in one point, you become accountable for all of it. What James is saying here is not necessarily that all sins are equal. That's not true. If you look at the Old Testament law, you see varying degrees of punishments for different kinds of sin. God's justice is always in measure with our sins. His point is not that all sins are equal. His point is that if you break one part of the law, then what are you? You're a lawbreaker. That's what you are. If you transgress, to use the words of verse 9, then you are a transgressor, and you are therefore accountable as a breaker of the law, as a transgressor of the law. And he's arguing, I think, against those of us who might say, is this really that big a deal, James? If I you know, tend to draw, if I'm drawn towards some people and I avoid other people and I don't love everybody equally, is that really such a big deal? Well, James says, yes. Even though many people may commit this sin, and it may be socially acceptable in certain forms, consider this. The law is the unified expression of the character and will of God. This law was fulfilled perfectly by Jesus Christ. 
It was embodied and taught by Jesus Christ. And so James calls it in verse eight, the royal law. It's the law of our king, Jesus Christ. And to disregard the law is to disregard Christ. It's to disregard the one who speaks through the law. Notice verse 11. He says, he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. When we violate any part of the law, when we disregard the law, we are disregarding the one who gave us the law. And that's a big deal. There is no selective obedience to Christ. It's all or nothing. Showing partiality is wrong. It is sin. And it's a disregarding of Jesus Christ. But secondly, it's serious because it invites God's judgment. It invites God's judgment. Verses 12 through 13. So speak and act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. James warns us that preferential treatment, showing partiality, this kind of bias, it has consequences. Verse 10 tells us that as lawbreakers, we are accountable. And verse 12 urges us uh, to respond to this truth, to let everything we say and do be done with the knowledge that we are going to stand before the judge one day. And we are going to be judged under this law of liberty. Notice, it's not the law of Moses with all of its rituals and all of its unique uh, rules for that day. We're going to be judged under the law of liberty as it is embodied by Christ. Perfect love for God and perfect love for others. And the one who fulfilled this law is going to be the one who stands to judge us by this law. In James chapter 4, verse 12, James says, There is only one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to save and destroy. The good news there is that Jesus is able to save. The sober warning is that he is also able to destroy. For those who are in Christ, for those who have genuine faith in Christ, we know that there there is no condemnation for us. That's the good news of the gospel. No condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's what Paul says in Romans. The day of judgment for us will be a day in which our standing in Christ guarantees we will be accepted by God. Eternal life is ours, and we know that with a certainty. But although we are under no condemnation, our actions will be evaluated and our works will be examined. To use the words of Paul in 1 Corinthians 3, those works will pass through the fire and the wood, hay, and the stubble, the things that are corrupt, the things that lack eternal value, they will burn. But the good works will remain, the gold and the silver and the precious stones. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 10 says, We all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. There is a reward coming for those who are believers that that is related to our good works as Christians here in this life. And our behavior needs to be marked by a realization that that day is coming. But for some, this day of judgment will reveal something very sobering. It will reveal that they never knew Christ. That it will reveal that they are not in him. They have not been reconciled to God through faith in the death and resurrection of his son. And so they are therefore under condemnation. A life that is characterized by partiality. A lifelong practice of discrimination a life that, that proves to be self-serving and refuses to show mercy to others, that is evidence, James says, of a person who is spiritually dead, a person who is separated from God, a person who is still in their sins. And there will be no mercy for such people on the day of judgment. James is touching here on a theme that he will expand throughout the rest of chapter 2 that good works always flow from genuine salvation, from true faith, saving faith. Judgment will be without mercy to those who have shown no mercy. Why? Because they are giving evidence that they have never repented of their sin and they've never received the mercy that God extends to sinners through Christ. If they had received this mercy, then they would have shown it to others. But mercy will triumph over judgment, verse 13, in this sense, 
when we stand before the judge on the last day, if our lives were marked by showing mercy towards others, compassion towards others, love without discrimination towards others, then that will demonstrate, it will be the proof that we have indeed already received God's saving mercy. Jesus said this in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, verse 7, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. We have no fear of judgment in this case. Mercy triumphs. So let me ask you, as you read this text, and as you're listening to my words this morning, evaluate your life for a moment. Do you tend to show favor to some and ignore others? Maybe it's not a financial thing for you. Maybe you don't care if somebody's wealthy or not, but perhaps you are impressed by external appearances. You gravitate towards those who dress like you and act like you, who seem to be in the same social stratus that that you are. You know, in our culture, we tend to put a premium on appearance and physical attractiveness. Maybe you're the kind of person who gravitates gravitates towards those who were popular and outgoing, and you avoid those that are difficult to talk to. Or maybe you're the kind of person who gravitates towards the quiet and intellectual types, the people who think like you and, and maybe enjoy the same sorts of, of books or, or hobbies that you do. Maybe you're the kind of person who feels a little uncomfortable around people that are different. They're of a different ethnicity or a different generation than you are, from a different background. Maybe they have a different culture. James tells us not to show partiality in the church. We are to love without distinction and to give no special treatment to anyone but to welcome all equally. To show partiality is incompatible, friends, with faith in Christ. It is contrary to the gospel of grace that we have received and it is morally wrong before God. I want to add one precaution for some of you who perhaps may feel discriminated against Maybe this sermon and this text is bringing up painful memories and real experiences that you've had at the hands of others who have not treated you rightly. Maybe it's because of the color of your skin. Maybe it's because of your age. Maybe it's because of how you educate your kids or your politics or your culture. But you feel that other people have mistreated you and they have shown partiality. I want to urge you, please be careful this morning to guard your heart against any sort of resentment or bitterness towards other people. Guard your heart against hypocrisy and returning partiality in kind. I want to remind you of the story that Jesus told in Matthew chapter 18. There was a servant who owed the king an insurmountable sum. And he came before him when the time was come, when the debt was to be paid, and he asked for mercy. And the king bestowed mercy upon him. He forgave the debt. And that servant, as he left, crossed paths with a fellow servant who owed him a much smaller sum. And the man refused to show mercy to his fellow servant. Jesus says that this wicked servant was condemned and thrown in prison to be punished for his gross hypocrisy. Let me encourage you, friend, if you've been discriminated against, if people have not treated you rightly, Do not allow resentment or bitterness to fester in your heart. Consider the mercy and the love and the grace that you have received from God through Jesus Christ, if you're a believer. And in light of that, let me encourage you to extend that same mercy and that forgiveness to others. Reflect the grace of the gospel to them. And don't allow your heart to be shackled by bitterness or resentment. My friends, let me just remind us in in closing, we are all spiritually bankrupt apart from Christ. All of us had nothing to offer him. But God has chosen the poor of this world, you and me, to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom. He has lavished upon all who believe the riches of his grace in Christ Jesus. May we each endeavor to follow his example, to live out our faith, in harmony with the gospel, in obedience to his royal law. May God be glorified as we extend to others the same mercy that we have received, as we seek to love them all 
without distinction. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. I thank you for the way it encourages us as it reminds us of your grace. It reminds us of the mercy that we have in you. And I thank you also, God, for the grace of conviction that your spirit is so faithful to gently expose those areas of sin in our hearts that need to change. Lord, we know that the thrust of this text is not just dealing with behavior, but dealing with the heart behind that behavior. I pray, God, that today, through the preaching of your word, that you would do real work in our hearts, that your spirit would would change us, that we would reflect more faithfully the grace and the mercy and the love that we find in the gospel, the grace and mercy and love that so many of us have received. I ask, God, that you would make our church a good example of impartial love, of grace that is shown without distinction to all. And God, I want to pray for any who are listening right now who have yet to receive the saving grace of the gospel. Perhaps today they're realizing that they are spiritually bankrupt apart from you and they need something that only you can provide. I pray that, Lord, today they would understand that there's nothing they can come and offer to somehow earn this grace There's nothing they can do to somehow earn salvation or accomplish it on their own. They need simply to come as beggars with empty hands, trusting your promise that you will save all who look to the cross in faith. I pray that today you would awaken them to their need and fix their eyes upon our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, who has fulfilled the law, who has died to pay the penalty for sin, and who has raised again to secure salvation for all who will believe in him. Lord, let your gospel go far and wide today and take root in the hearts of those who need to know you. We pray, God, that you'd be glorified this morning in all of this, and we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, before we let you go this morning, just a couple of things. First of all, uh, today is a bittersweet day um, because it would have been the last Sunday for a very special family in our church. Many of you know Caleb and Amanda Booker and their children. You know little Clara and Graham and Jane. And uh, the Bookers have been with us really since day one. They were part of our original church planting team. And uh, they are going to be moving this week to Olathe. And uh, Caleb has a job there. He works at Garmin. And they just bought a home there. And they're going to be moving and getting involved in uh, at Countryside at our sending church. So this would have been the last Sunday that Caleb and Amanda and their kids got to worship with us. And because of everything going on uh, with the coronavirus, unfortunately, we're not able to be together and to hug them and to see their faces. Uh, but we do want to just publicly say thank you to Caleb and Amanda. Uh, they have served behind the scenes so faithfully. Uh, They have weekly been a part of our worship here, and it's not going to be the same with them gone. We love them. We will miss them. Caleb and Amanda, we thank you, and we pray God's blessing on you as you guys transition away from Redemption Hill and back to Countryside. Um, You will always be considered family and friends here, and maybe we'll get to see you once in a while. You can always come back and visit if you want. Um, But publicly, um, speaking on behalf of the church, we want to thank you for the many ways you have served, and we wish you God's best as you transition away. So if you're watching at home this morning, uh, maybe send Caleb or Amanda a text if you got their number. Tell them thank you. Tell them you love them and be praying for them as they make the transition back to Olathe. Um, Also, in this time of not being able to gather together, our communication is something that is of utmost importance because we can't see each other on Sunday. So I just want to remind you, if you're not on our church email list, that is really the primary way that we're communicating with people throughout the week. So please let us know. If you'd like to be on that list, send an email to info at rhlawrence.org. And I will put you on our email list. And that way you can get announcements, you can get updates, uh, you can get all the information that we're sending out uh, throughout the week. And if you're already on that list, but maybe you never open those emails, I'm just asking you to please check in, pay attention, because we do send out um, uh, updates. And right now, while everything's changing so much, there's some important things that go out um, via that email distribution list. So try to watch for those emails. And I will also say this. Um, 
we are very aware that there may be needs and challenges to some in the body during this time. I've spoken with all of our deacons and our small group leaders, and what we're attempting to do is try to touch base with everyone in the church um, once every week or two. So hopefully you'll be hearing from a deacon or a small group leader at some point uh, if you're a regular part of our church. If they call you, uh, don't be confused and say, why are you calling me? You've never called me before. Uh, Hopefully they have called you before, but um, just know that they're planning to reach out to check in on you, see how you're doing. And and we want to keep communication open with everyone in the body. Uh, So uh, hopefully you'll be hearing from someone if you haven't already in the next week or so. And again, please let us know if you have needs, if there's challenges, if you're discouraged, if there's ways we can pray for you. We want to minister to you during these times. And so we're gonna be hoping to communicate to you. Um, So that's all we have for this morning. I'd like to to thank you once again uh, for joining us during this time. For those of you that are still here and haven't uh, already checked out, but we're going to close by reading from 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Paul writes, Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times in every way. The Lord be with you all. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen.